So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, yes, uh, good evening. I have been asked to speak to you about science, or to give it its correct technical name, so-called science. <laughs> so-called science is an activity carried out by so-called scientists, shadowy, generally anonymous figures intent on one thing, the relentless pursuit of money. These so-called scientists, notorious for their lifestyles, their love of cutting-edge gadgetry and their trips to exotic locations are remorseless in their pursuit of the vast, almost incomprehensible sums of money at stake in the form of the huge, limitless pool of cash known as research grants. <laughs> These enormous sums are used to fund their frivolous trips to glaciers and ice packs, their luggage bursting with designer sweaters and padded anoraks, there to play with their boys' toys, drilling ice cores and sending balloons up into the atmosphere to measure carbon so-called dioxide. <laughs> the substance which so-called science ludicrously claims can warm the entire Earth, despite it being just a tiny molecule consisting of just two oxygen atoms and one of carbon. These atoms themselves consisting largely of nothing, and yet absurdly, these conveniently invisible so-called molecules <laughs> are supposedly able to form an enormous duvet round the Earth. Self-evidently nonsense. Yet, this is the so-called theory that provides the pretext for the true purpose of so-called science, which is, of course, the wholesale transfer of research grants from taxpayers to university and state-sponsored so-called climatology departments. Fortunately, ladies and gentlemen, there are a few brave and gallant souls who have dedicated themselves to exposing so-called science. These few noble men and women, supported only by a few hundred million dollar donations from the <laughs> modest profits of hard-pressed oil and energy multinationals, have volunteered in exchange for mere salaries and free holidays to expose this so-called science for what it is. A systematic attempt to draw inferences from large-scale data gathering and fearlessly to reveal the sinister web of atmospherics researchers, glaciologists and oceanographers who, communicating only through an impenetrable, heavily encrypted system of obscure journals and peer-reviewed research papers, <laughs> have constructed a conspiracy of such magnitude that it has taken in the Chinese government, the American government, the BBC, and 97% of all so-called scientists. It has not, of course, taken in the splendid Australians, who have been very fortunate, of course, because the propaganda ceased to be beamed in there after their latest heat wave was hot enough to melt all their satellite dishes. Would that we could all be so lucky. But to defeat this conspiracy, two things are important. Fortunately, firstly, the world of journalism and the media is mercifully mostly free of people brainwashed by degrees in so-called science. Many influential columnists and commentators have studied proper, useful subjects like classics, history, land economy, or English literature, and are easily able to dismantle the so-called statistical facts and measurements of science through their skill in rhetoric, sarcasm, and editing. Secondly, those who have studied a proper hard science, such as theoretical psychology, will know that human beings are predisposed to believe what they want to believe, and that the job of scientists is to overcome emotional, political, financial, and inertial objections to change through the steady accumulation of evidence to the point where no reasonable doubt can remain. But it is the job of non-scientists to say, Oh, yes, but what do we mean by reasonable? This is all just a question of semantics. And carry on bullshitting like that for another few decades until the first really big chunk of the Antarctic lands in the sea and a really big city gets permanently flooded, at which point, fair enough, the game's up. <laughs> but until that time, ladies and gentlemen, we do not need to listen to the predictions of so-called science. Look at its track record. Science predicted the existence of a self-replicating molecule which carries inheritance. Ha! 
Science <laughs> predicted the observed position of a star would change during an eclipse as the light bent round the sun. Pa! Science predicted the course of a comet so accurately we were able to land on it at 33,000 miles an hour. What does this tell you about science? It tells you, obviously, that science is by far the most reliable way we have of observing and predicting. It is therefore a major problem for any democratic society. <laughs> which believes that all opinions count and everyone's view is equally valid. So-called science strikes at the very heart of our most cherished belief that all shall be free to talk complete bollocks for money. It must be fought, for what makes us human is our stupidity, our laziness, our greed, our stubbornness. To err is human, as Alexander Pope said. And those of you with a proper degree in English literature will know. <laughs> that is, if you're not up in a balloon all day looking for invisible magic duvet molecules. Science, because it constantly adjusts itself to the evidence, will eventually be proved correct, because it always is. And belatedly, we will scramble to adjust in a last-minute frantic rush, because we always do. Why humans are like this, we do not know. And if so-called science was any use, someone would have found out. Thank you very much.